Our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 13 through 21, the feeding of 5,000. Listen for the word of the Lord. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's just something about leftovers when you're a kid, isn't there? You just can't stand them. Or at least my brother and I couldn't stand them. But still, every night after dinner, my mom would take any food that wasn't eaten and would put it away in Tupperware containers or, you know, those old country crop containers and tuck it away in the back of the refrigerator. We always hoped that mom would forget about that food and that it would go bad before we were forced to eat it again. That rarely happened, though, because every other week or so, we'd have what we called must-goes, also known as leftovers that were about to go bad. Mom and Dad would warm up all these random containers, and we'd have some sort of a buffet line there spread out on the kitchen counter. On top of that, if the food was about to go bad, it didn't matter if it didn't go together. We had to eat it. You want some spaghetti to go with your Salisbury steak? Great. You can have both of them. It was a must-go. This all began to change, though, when Amanda and I got married. My disdain for leftovers disappeared in the face of my own laziness. That's because we realized we could cook for four people and purposefully make leftovers. That slashed the amount of meals that I had to cook. It cut it in half. It was genius. It's not much more work, we found, to make for four people as it is for two. Plus, I'd only have to cook half as often. I wouldn't have to cook later on in the week. We would just have to warm something up. What could be better than that when you're as lazy as me? But still, when it comes to having leftovers, I wonder, I wonder sometimes if they could be a sign of something more, more than my own laziness. I wonder if they could be instead a a sign of something more, something extravagant. At least that's what Matthew seems to be telling us in our scripture reading. This passage, though, starts out with quite a bit of heartache. Jesus has just found out, he just heard that his cousin, his friend, John the Baptist, has been murdered by Herod. Jesus is understandably distraught, and like many of us in these moments, we just want to get away. We want to spend some time alone, grieving, collecting ourselves. So Jesus heads out into the wilderness to a deserted place far from any town or village. But the crowds, the crowds figured out where he went, and they followed him. The people just loved Jesus. They wanted to be near him. After all, they knew Jesus was at least an amazing teacher and a miracle worker. He could cure diseases, open the eyes of the blind, restore lost hearing. He could even cast out demons and perform exorcisms. Plus, he's, he's so loving, so kind. People were just drawn to him. I can just imagine Jesus getting out of that boat, though, and seeing this huge mass of people. You and I would probably get back in that boat and head as far away from them as possible. Not Jesus. Rather than sending the crowd away so that he could have some alone time, he has compassion on them. He sees these people, these sheep without a shepherd, 
and he has mercy on them. He begins to minister to them by healing all of those who were ill. This work continued for so long that very few people had noticed the sun was beginning to dip behind the hills nearby. They hadn't noticed the growing darkness, the growing shadows, but they had noticed the growling in their stomachs. They hadn't planned to be out there that long. They hadn't planned to follow Jesus so far from home, so they didn't bring any food with them. The disciples, though, of course, had noticed the sun going down, and they knew that people were getting hungry. They could feel that they were getting hungry. So they pushed through the crowd and came to Jesus and pulled him aside. Jesus, this is a deserted place. The hour is now late. Send the crowds away into the villages and buy f- so they can buy food for themselves. That makes sense, right? That's what we would want to do. That's the fair thing to do. These people don't have any food, so they need to be sent on their way so they can go and buy something for themselves. We don't want them stuck out in the middle of nowhere at night with nothing to eat. That's dangerous. <laughs> but Jesus, as always, has other ideas. He tells the disciples, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. The disciples' mouths must have fallen open in shock. You want us to do what, Jesus? You want us to feed these thousands of people? How do you propose we do that exactly? We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. We have nothing, not even enough to feed us. What do you want us to do? Jesus just shakes his head. I can see it. Bring the food to me, he says. Then after having the crowd take the seat, uh, take a seat, he, he takes the loaves and the fish, and he looks up to heaven and blesses them. And then he breaks that bread and gives it to his disciples and has them pass it out. And the process, that's when the miracle happened. No matter how much the disciples gave out, there was always more. The baskets never ran out. There was always fish and bread for everyone. There was enough for everyone. What's more is the people didn't just get a bit of food, just enough to hold them over until they got home. No, Matthew tells us the crowd ate and was filled. They ate as much as they wanted, second, third, fourth helpings, whatever it took for their stomachs to be filled. Then as the meal came to an end, the disciples went through the crowd again, this time picking up any extra food. And to their amazement, they filled 12 baskets to the brim with leftover fish and bread, with leftovers. These five loaves and two fish had become an extravagant feast, a full-fledged bounty in Jesus' hands, enough to feed 5,000 men, Matthew says. (laughs) And by my best preacher math, that's somewhere around 20 to 30,000 people if you count women and children. It's a huge number of people. And they ate and were filled with food to spare. You see, Jesus, God with us, had been at work this whole time. The one who had made the universe out of nothing had taken this humble offering and made it not just enough, but more than enough. And he did all of this using what the disciples referred to as nothing. Did you catch that? We have nothing here, they said. Just these five loaves and two fish. This is nothing, not even worth counting. But it wasn't nothing, not in God's capable and gracious hands. He took what they thought were worthless things, something not even worth counting, and used it to showcase his amazing glory, his abundance. He transformed that meager meal into something more than they could ever have dreamed of. He transformed it into a meal that was more than enough. And you know, it's amazing how often God still does this. You see, this miracle isn't locked away in the library of Scripture. Not at all. God is still faithfully providing for the needs of his kingdom. He's still miraculously changing whatever we have to offer into an incredible abundance, something that is more than enough. In fact, a friend of mine pastors a Methodist church on the outer banks of North Carolina where this kind of thing actually happened in living memory. Back in the 1930s, 
This church near Cape Hatteras had seen its share of storms and high tides. Their little wooden sanctuary was in awful shape. And the people of Avon were doing everything they could to keep their house of worship standing. But back then, just as it is now, this little village was home to largely working class people. They were fishermen and people who made their homes or their businesses, their money, out on the water. This wasn't an area packed with wealth, not, not by any means. But as they watched their sanctuary crumble, they knew they had to do something. So they spent some time in prayer. They asked God, what were we supposed to do with this? And in their prayer time, they heard God calling them to build a new sanctuary, a new building, because their church and its ministries were vital to what God was doing on Cape Hatteras. So the church committed to building a new sanctuary, but they didn't know how it was going to happen. They didn't have the money, not even close to enough money, but they knew that God would provide. And then he did. Then it happened. The next season, when the people went out to harvest the oysters, they found that there were more oysters than they had ever seen. Their boats, their baskets, their trucks were all loaded down with what became the largest oyster harvest in North Carolina history, a record that still stands to this very day. And when all was said and done, the people pulled their money and realized they had more than enough to build a new brick sanctuary, one that would stand against the summer storms. And I'm here today to tell you that sanctuary still stands in Avon on Cape Hatteras. And from that building, that church worships the Lord our God every Sunday morning. They make new disciples of Jesus Christ, and they provide fresh produce, fresh fruits and vegetables, and endless amounts of food for those who are in need on the island. All because the people refused to close up shop when things got tough. And instead trusted God's grace, trusting that he would provide for the needs of his kingdom, trusting that he would make what they ha take what they had and make it more than enough. So as we look during our stewardship campaign here about what God, what God has given each and every one of us, do you see it as nothing? Do you see it as something not even worth mentioning, something not even worth counting? Or do you see your gifts, great or small, everything in between, as something God can transform into an abundant fee, something that is more than enough? I was challenged by this idea by our pastor when Amanda and I got married. When we went through pre-marriage counseling, he challenged us to give to our church when we were just starting out, when we, when we thought we had nothing to offer. After we got married, I, I, Amanda had moved to North Carolina. I was still in seminary, and Amanda was working for North Carolina public schools, making the state minimum, which is even less than the Texas state minimum. But still, we felt God calling us to trust him with what we had. So in our discussions together, we went back and forth on how much to give before ultimately deciding to give 10% of every paycheck back to the church. Every two weeks, we would give. It certainly wasn't much in terms of worldly wealth, not, not even close. But we knew God would use our gifts to do great things for our church. That he would use them in ways that we couldn't imagine, and it would become more than enough. And then when I graduated from seminary and we moved home back to Houston, we continued this practice. But this time, we were both working and both making full-time salaries. Even when Emma was born and things got tight, as I often do with a new baby. The first thing we do still after every paycheck is give to this church because we believe in this church. We believe in what God is doing here. We believe God is using this church, our church, to build his kingdom here in Mount Bellevue. We're still not wealthy by worldly standards, not even close. We're a preacher and a teacher, y'all get that. But still we give to this church. 10% of every one of my paychecks, and 5% of Amanda's, with the other 5% going to the Texas A&M Wesley Foundation. But when we can, we give more. Like when we felt God calling us to give extra to help with the restoration of this building. That's how invested we are in this church, in this family of God, in our family from God.
We know God is doing great things here, so we trust that he will take what we have to offer and transform it, making it more than enough. And we know he'll do the same with each and every one of your gifts, too. Because our God is a God of grace and abundance, who puts before us a great heavenly feast where all are filled with more than enough left over. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to share with you as well, I hope you received in the mail in the last week our stewardship brochure. It's really a narrative budget where the staff has put together a proposed budget um, to fit the uh, goals that Church Council has outlined in our three-hour visioning session in the fall. Those goals are written on the back. I want to just walk us through them. It, we want to continue to build our close-knit community where people know each other's names, where we care for one another. Where you get a birthday card from UMW. You have uh, fifth Sunday lunches, and people just are committed to one another. That kind of community. We want to keep building that. We want to improve our community outreach, the food pantry, the scouts, our preschool, and other ways of serving our community. But third, and this is the big one, our church council is committed to investing heavily in our discipleship ministries, particularly our children's ministry, by hiring a part-time, 20-hour-a-week director of children's ministry. We've never had something like that here, as best I can tell. From talking to leaders, from talking to Pastor Clayton, we've always had a director of family ministries who focus on children and youth generally. This person will be focused just on birth to fifth grade building up that ministry so that we, when they get older, we'll have a need to hire a youth director. And that ministry continue to where we'll have a large group of children and youth here in our church being ministered to, being served by our community, and learning to put their faith and their trust in Christ. We also know that our community is expanding at a rapid rate. New families are moving in all the time, south of I-10, as well as the new homes being built on this side, on the Mont Bellevue side of I-10. When I drop Emma off at, at daycare, almost every parent, I think, is n relatively new to this community. What an awesome opportunity to be in ministry here, to offer children's programming, children's discipleship ministries, and to reach those young families, those young men and women who are just starting out and minister to them as well. We have an amazing opportunity, but we need your help to do that. So the budget inside is sort of our, the staff's dream that we'll take to finance and church council, what we think is the first step on that road. It involves hiring that person, that staff, and also growing the money that we have for those ministries, for children and youth ministries. Um, it also looks at expanding mission and outreach and worship, our live streaming ministry, and other things we need around the building, including continuing to pay um, our necessary insurance and other bills. So I hope you take the opportunity to look through this narrative budget, read the letter on the back, look at the pictures. Um, we're really proud of this. And we hope that this coming Sunday, on the 23rd, that you'll tear off this tab on the end and you'll fill it out with your estimated giving for this year. This isn't a pledge card. This isn't a commitment card. We're not going to bill you or call you at the end of the year. But it's to help us track our budget to help us make goals, to help us track uh, cash flow, make sure that we're good stewards with what God has entrusted in us through your giving. So I invite you to pray over that and bring it with you to church this coming Sunday. And pray for your church, for our church, that we might reach these new people, the people who've been here for decades, people who've been here for generations, and share with them the good news of Jesus Christ, that God's abundance is possible. We just offer up whatever we have. God is faithful and loving and gracious and will do great things just like he's doing here at our church. Amen.